Park. Hello, how is everyone? <laughs> I'm gonna have a fun talk. <laughs> this is gonna be the light jaunty one of the, uh, of the day. So, um, like he said, uh, content warning, we're gonna, there's gonna be some Nazis. Um, but, you know, that's just the internet now. It's great, what a time to be alive, I love it. So, um, my name is Lindsay Ellis. I uh, primarily work on YouTube. I do uh, media criticism, which is kind of a fancy way of saying I spend an hour talking about how much I hated the Beauty and the Beast remake. <laughs> Um, I also uh, do have a show where I talk about um, uh, film theory concepts because that's my area of study uh, using only Michael Bay's Transformers. I'm also the host of PBS Digital Studios It's Lit, which is going to be relevant in this talk. <laughs> so um, I thought about um, having this talk when a friend of mine uh, became the nth or so person um, sliding into my DMs like, hey, <laughs> there's an alt-right mob after me. You know what this is like. What do I do? <laughs> and I kind of had a moment where I'm like, wow, this, is, this keeps happening, where people ask me advice on how to deal with bad faith hate mobs from, you know, let's be nice and call them diet Nazis. Um, and it kind of made me realize that there are just aren't really any resources for that sort of thing. And I had this sad realization that I kind of had become an expert in surviving that sort of thing because it has happened to me many, many times over the years and I just never talk about it because I don't really want to draw attention to it. And there's sort of two internets uh, because people who, if you know who I am here, you probably don't know me in the same way that people in the other internet know me, which is like, you know, SJW punching bag. Um, and a lot of times people are surprised to like learn that like, yeah, oh yeah, I've been through it. But um, so I'm gonna talk about this today and this is actually kind of the first time I've really talked about that, so it's exciting. So uh, this, is about a, this is sort of a story about a thing that happened to me last year. It's a jaunty little thing I like to call the white genocide incident. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. <laughs> You better laugh, because this was hard. Like, <laughs> this was a really um, kind of dumb thing that happened last year. And it all started uh, with a Twitter joke about a YA novel that was published 2011-ish called Save the Pearls. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Save the Pearls is like, it's a self-published YA novel about like this, the, where white people are the oppressed class <laughs> and black people are the ruling class. See, it's sunnier now and they got that melanin, see? So um, that's sort of something I kind of like to come back to every now and then because I think it's funny. Um, and the original, um, the original tweet that, uh, Precipitated it is gone because like I, I have a Twitter deleter now that automatically deletes everything that's more than a year old. Highly recommend that just to cover your just to cover yourself. Um, so uh, then, as I'm joking about this, one of these people slides into my mentions like, "Well, you know, white genocide is real," and I respond with this tweet, like, "Heck yeah, it's real." <laughs> I just get, I love it. <laughs> I got a Pinterest board ready to go. So, um, yeah, five retweets, 31 likes. And I think like, it's incredibly telling that the name of the account that I'm responding to, and that tweet is also gone, so I don't have a screen cap of it, is Russian Hacksaw. Always a good sign. So this was in April of 2017. Flash forward a year later, summer of 2018, it's the weekend of Comic-Con International, and guess who gets canceled? It's James Gunn. Oh no. <laughs> this surely isn't going to start a troubling trend that we're dealing with to this day. So, for those of you who don't know who James Gunn is, James Gunn um, is the director of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and uh, um, gar he was fired from his job of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in the summer of 2018 because he made some bad tweets. And let's be clear, 
they were bad tweets. He should not have said what he said and he should not have done that. But the people who motivated this uh, campaign to get him fired were, well, I'm not going to name them, but you know, the, the basket of alt-right dipshits, you, you, you can guess who they were. Um, basically because James Gunn was a vocal um, critic of El Presidente. So it was a kind of an interesting, like, qualm for a lot of people on the left because the things he said were pretty bad, but A, they were a long time ago, and B, he had kind of addressed them in the meantime and had demonstrated that he had changed, but Disney immediately panicked and let him go. So I kind of, you know, like so many could see where this was going, um, was kind of a vocal defender of James Gunn. And I definitely caught some flack for that because it's kind of bad optics to throw your advocacy behind a very wealthy white man who works for Disney. <laughs> but I, I, I still stand by what I said because the reason I supported him was because this action was going to empower people to scour the online histories of their political enemies, especially alt-right circles like the people who went after Gunn, to use bad faith criticisms to ruin people's lives and careers. And it did not end with James Gunn. I think everyone in this room can think of a lot of instances of people using bad faith criticisms to go after people, usually journalists, that they don't like. And there were a lot of campaigns coordinated by these very same people. And I also knew <laughs> that given that this tactic succeeded, it would only be a matter of time before they came for me. And they did. About six weeks later, there's that tweet again, oh boy. So, I do a show for PBS. <laughs> they really don't like PBS. <laughs> it's publicly funded, they hate that. Uh, but they also really hate the idea that like, uh, certain people get money from publicly funded things. So, this uh, Twitter account called Blue Check Watch um, found my, uh, well, my PBS headshot, my PBS bio, um, and my uh, <laughs> tweet. And also, I think it's really funny that they go with WGBH, which is the Boston affiliate. Uh, I work for Digital Studios. Uh, and I, like, it's only really, it was last night that I realized, because we like, were puzzling for the why. Why did they go after WGBH? I've never even been to Boston. Um, and I realized it's because this guy must be a Boston local, and he logged onto the PBS website, and it defaults to your local PBS affiliate. <laughs> so uh, the Boston affiliate paid the price for that. Um, and uh, I don't know if, so, and you can also can't see because like this, this tweet is obviously gone because this account is gone. Um, and so th these were just like stuff that we mined and kept for years. You can't see how many retweets it had, but it was like over seven or 8,000 retweets. It was, uh, it was bad. Uh, but I also like, you can't really see my Twitter account, my Twitter avatar. Um, this is it. <laughs> Very serious enemy am I for the righteous uh, folks of meme America to destroy their anti-white racist. So I highlight this because these, you know, when we talk about bad faith, these people do not care about humor or irony. Everything is taken like, yes, it's literal. White genocide Pinterest board, it's a thing that exists. So. Here are some more samples, <laughs> um, which is, I think, like, personally, like, the fact that they go after PBS Nature and <laughs> PBS American Masters. <laughs> and my favorite, my favorite over here is uh, God Would Care. Like, if this is true, you might need a mental health intervention. I'd feel unsafe being her coworker, knowing she was for genocide. <laughs> So this was awful. Um, so like, you know, these brain geniuses don't know and don't care that I don't work for any PBS affiliate. I'm not even an employee. I do contract labor sometimes. Um, and PBS DS is mostly completely unaffiliated with individual affiliates, but you know, they don't care. That's not the point. What, oh boy. So hey, let's call the LA affiliate. Here's their number. Oh, and they did. <laughs> like they were calling their, the LA affiliate, they called the, their, a lot of local affiliates. Um, 
and it was just like flooded with this. There were emails, and uh, then it made it to blue check mark conservative Twitter. Oh boy, PBS host is really excited about that white genocide. <laughs> And I, I want you guys to really appreciate this ad. <laughs> I feel like that like, really tells you something about the demo of big league politics.com. Yep. It's killing them dead. Chuck Woolery got involved. The game show host, <laughs> I'm sorry, former game show host, and current extremely poor man's James Woods on Twitter. <sighs> yeah, so that sucked. Um, I was lucky in that like PBS, I, all of the affiliates, like it was humiliating because you had to have like all of these people like going back and forth being like, hmm, this seems an awful lot like the thing that happened to Sarah Zhang at the New York Times last month. So, but at the same time, they still had to like address it and deal with it. And, you know, we had to collate all these tweets. We had to like mine everything and be absolutely clear on um, like who said what and when and what the threat was, and it was very awful. And um, like I have to joke about it now because you know we got these coping mechanisms. See, but another thing was this happened right before XOXO last year, <sighs> and I had not said anything about this, because I didn't want anyone to know that I was a Nazi magnet. So uh, I, wow, last year was not great, because I spent the whole weekend, like if I met someone, I would immediately fall into this like, oh God, what have you heard? Oh God, what do you know? Um, and it, it was like, that was sort of like the big, you know, catalyst to like a big mental health crisis. Um, I was going to have a section here called um, celebrities who have seen me weep openly in public. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to name names, but like there people saw me cry in hotel lobbies last year. It was really embarrassing. Uh, the way John Scalzi described it was about half of a Joko cruise. Um, <laughs> apologies to anyone I embarrassed. So, and it's like in addition to that, it was like it, you know, harmed my relationships. It like harmed my marriage. It cost me a lot of productivity and several friendships, and eventually I actually ended up at an institution because everything was just crumbling and I did not know how to deal with this. Because I, I don't know if you've, anyone has gone through something like this, but there is nothing, nothing more isolating than being targeted because the whole purpose is to isolate you and make you toxic to your colleagues and they don't want to touch you because if they touch you publicly, then they get it too. And there's another thing. This is not the first time this has happened to me. And it probably won't be the last um, because this is just the world now. And it wasn't even the meanest, honestly, because there's something kind of like, well, at least they have beliefs. <laughs> Because a lot of times people will do it and it's just because it's fun to be mean to people. And I'm at a place now where I can talk about it and joke about it because I spent the last year, um, you know, go doing, doing the therapy rigmarole. I'm on a much better, you know, more stable set of medication. Uh, to reiterate what Tracy said yesterday, do go to therapy. Even if you don't know if you need it, go to therapy. But this is still kind of difficult to talk about. <laughs> Because I, I, I do still have some trauma associated with this. And um, the thing about being afraid all the time, even if you're not in sort of like a, a, a literal, physical, like, you know, war zone, is being afraid messes with your brain chemistry. And then you start having the same responses that you would have if you had been in sort of a physical danger. Like you become jumpy, you become more irritable, you, you irritable, you become more depressed. And that a lot of that is because the goal here is to hurt you. And it's not just scary on a personal level. These people are feeling empowered enough in their own racism that they thought P white genocide Pinterest board was a compelling argument to a national broadcasting company. Like, they, thousands of people thought that, yeah, they'd be like, oh, wow, yeah, 
anti-white racism is a thing, we should probably fire this person. Because the thing is, when well-intentioned people fall for bad faith tactics, bad faith people continue to employ them. But we are lucky in that people are seeing through this in a way that they weren't a year ago. But when these people come for you, they cannot be reasoned with. And that is a mistake a lot of people make. They do not want to be reasoned with. They are bad faith attacks because they do not see you as a human. And when I say bad faith, because a lot of people say like, well, sometimes there's good faith criticism. And that's true. Obviously, this is not an example of that. But that is true. But to me, it turns into bad faith when people stop denying your humanity and start using you as a proxy in their whatever culture war thing is going on. But this, is, this talk is not just about the overriding problem of harassment culture and bad faith arguments and the fact that the racists are feeling really empowered these days. Because um, there's a lot of talk about the external process, um, automation, moderation, how to curb harassment, um, cancel culture, is it good? Uh, but not a lot about the internal one, which was kind of what catalyzed this. Um, so, how do you deal with it? <laughs> I've become an expert. I don't, know, I don't know if I've become an expert on dealing with it well, <laughs> but you have to cope or you die. The two options. So let's say a bunch of Nazis are trying to get you deplatformed from your public broadcasting corporation. <laughs> oh no, <sighs> my brand. What'll I do? I'm going to XOXO and they might know. What'll they think? Because it feels like you have a disease now. And you kind of do, especially if you're on Twitter. <laughs> Because nothing on the internet dies. What happens is, it, these people, there's always going to be a subset of people who will see you existing. Maybe they'll see you interacting with another Twitter person. And they just kind of take it upon themselves to slide into the mentions of whoever is interacting with you and being like, she's an anti-white racist. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's funny. Like, <laughs> uh, but, and then, other people, by proxy, are punished for daring to interact with you on a public forum. The, you know, that, that has happened to me a lot, and it still kind of happens sometimes, where I'll interact with someone that maybe I don't know that well, and then some rando comes in, like, white power bill, like, <laughs> she's an anti-white racist. And that's not the only thing they come after me for. They're, they have a list. There's, like, literally a website that has a list of ways to harass me. Although it does kind of remind me of that Arrested Development sketch when Job gets stabbed by white power bill, and he's like, white power, and Job's like, but I'm white. <laughs> so, when you are, as in my case, a minor public figure and it happens to you, you have two options. Especially if the mainstream media doesn't notice and nobody notices and nobody really cares, you can either be open about what's happening to you or you don't. I chose don't. Because if the mainstream media doesn't notice, thank God they didn't, and it doesn't become a story, and it doesn't become discourse, and you don't stand up for yourself, no one outside of that bubble is going to know. And that's why it all often surprises people when I'm like, there was this whole thing, and it far from the first time this has happened to me. It's like, well, wow, I didn't hear about it. It's like, yeah, because I didn't say anything. Um, and I had a chat with another person who um, is a friend of mine when I was dealing with this, I was like, what do I do? Should I stand up for myself? And he's like, well, you can, but if you decide to do that, it, that becomes part of your brand. <laughs> and if you come out about people abusing you and you, do, and you speak your truth, that means you could become more well-known for being the harassed one than for anything you've ever actually done. So, let's say you want to make that go away. Here's some shit that does not work. <laughs> Ignoring it does not work. That means, oh, I guess we have to try harder. Trying to reason with them <laughs> does not work. They are not here to be reasoned with. You cannot reason something out of something they did not reason themselves into. <sighs> Being self-deprecating and jokey-jokey does not work. Remember the Venom avatar. <laughs> they don't care. Disappearing does not work. That's evidence of guilt. Um, continuing, to, continuing to exist in a public space. That's exactly what they don't want you to do. They want you to stop existing. Apologizing, wow, does not work, because they don't care. They do not care about your humanity. And again, these are bad faith attacks. You are not a person. 
you are a proxy in a culture war. And it's not just that your silence of the goal, your silence is not just the goal, the silence of whatever you represent to them, and also the silence of the people that associate with you. Because you are not a human anymore. Sorry. So, what happens now? You're just existing in this like secret hell that nobody knows about and just continuing to have like, you know, pile on YouTube comments and oh god, they still do it. <laughs> like I have an assistant who like handles my YouTube comments. It's awful. I <laughs> she feel bad for her. Um, you basically feel like a disease because interacting with someone is going to invite your harassment into their space. So you end up apologizing just for existing. And then, in turn, people kind of treat you like you're a disease, because there is this sort of human nature thing, where it's like, even in this case, where it was pretty cut and dried, like, I'm not in the wrong, I just should have guessed that the racists were feeling really empowered these days and not joke about certain things. People still are kind of like, oh, you kind of deserve it, maybe, you know, like, maybe there was something you could have done to present it, you know, and it's just, <sighs> people can't really help but do the victim blaming thing, um, even well-intentioned people. And it also harms your relationship with your audience. You don't want to make content anymore. You don't trust people, and it's hard to make content for people when you think that half of them want you to die, and the other half don't even know about the first half. So the, then you become obsessed with prevention, and therefore you are required to know how these people think. You are required to know what might be possibly taken in bad faith. And if you, think, and if you don't think like these people, how do you even start to? How do you prevent this sort of thing? And it becomes like this crazy-making, circular mind game. You can't. So this is a conversation between Hank Green, Carlos Maza, and me. Let's unpack this. Do you guys know who Carlos Maza is? Yes, uh, support Carlos Maza. <laughs> so Carlos Maza um, is another YouTuber. Uh, he and I were like Twitter buds. We hadn't really met uh, before the crowdering happened. But basically, he had been abused and bullied by uh, another much bigger YouTuber named Steven Crowder for years. Like a lot of homophobic slurs, a lot of racist slurs. And one day, Carlos decided, <sighs> I'm just going to chronicle this. I'm going to stand up for myself. And, uh, yep, yeah. <laughs> you sure did. So you can guess what happened after that. Uh, Crowder mobilized his army and is continuing to. This is still happening. Um, and then you had the exact same thinking happen with Carlos. If he responds to, in this case, Hank, who is being supportive, sorry for the people that are harassing me, and now they are invited into your space. And, um, like, and then it's, you know, everybody scatter before they see us. This is the punishment for daring to interact with your colleagues in a public forum. And people become afraid of drawing the ire of the people harassing you. And that's not unreasonable, because it's like, if you respond to someone knowing their mentions are going to be flooded by those, <laughs> Isn't it fair to assume that they would kind of resent you for inviting that into their space? But that is the point. The point is to silence you. The point is to isolate you. And you can't read the minds of bad faith actors. So what do you do? Do you just not have a public face anymore? Do you just not interact with people? And a lot of the reason why Hank um, is sympathetic to Carlos is because he's been through it too. And this is another thing that I've found is like, if the people who are, tend to be the most sympathetic are the people who have either gone through it or who know people who have gone through it. And then, so what do? Because, as we've seen, you basically have to figure it out for yourself. You're completely isolated, and it's kind of a weird, unique situation where there's not really any resources for it. There's not like a hate mob support group because nobody wants to talk about it. And, you know, it's kind of telling when this happens to other people, they don't really have any resources they pull from, they come to me. <laughs> and so the thing is, I, you know, I am obviously not unique in this at all. And we're entering this era where there's this whole new kind of mental health crisis of this becoming more and more common of people getting dogpiled and isolated from their own communities. And no one really knows what to do with it. So 
<laughs> we're forced to give anecdotal evidence at a conference. Because <laughs> obviously, my anecdotes are not scientific. What else did I do? Well, um, drugs. Drugs are good, both prescription and otherwise. <laughs> And then, of course, cloistering yourself. And I do mean this, like, I, I see people like Carlos was an example where he would kind of like collate and seek out the abuse and um, actually highlight it. And I was like, no, you have to stop doing that because you're re-traumatizing yourself. And, you know, I see not just him, but I see that happening all the time with people highlighting their abusers and being like, ha ha, look at how wrong they are. You can't hurt me. I say way worse things about myself. And it's like, yes, they are very good at speaking the language of self-loathing. And they're very good at getting under your skin. And they are very good at actually making the trauma you already have worse because they speak the language of abuse. So. Uh, another thing I do is I basically have like my Twitter completely, you know, cloistered down, get into all of those advanced options, mute everything. And honestly, that's been a lot healthier ever since I've done that, even since like the, you know, the nonsense of last year died down. It's just, there's just such a huge volume of people at you, positive and negative. Um, and obviously, like, I, you know, it's obviously, but I, yeah, I get a lot of threats. Um, so we have basically like a, inbox for it. Um, I have someone that handles my YouTube comments for me. I don't look at them anymore. Um, and I don't really look at my Twitter mentions anymore. Um, but obviously, like, I, I'm, I am lucky in that I, I functionally have a staff. A lot of people don't have that. So what can you do? Well, um, there's also the option of a barter system, especially if you should be so unlucky as to be in, some, in a, similar, a position similar to mine. If you have someone that doesn't have any trauma attached to this sort of thing, they can keep an eye out for threats for you. But if it's not a threat and you're not in any danger, you should not subject yourself to people abusing you. You know, it becomes a form of digital self-harm, and that only makes things worse. But while we're here, this is all very isolationist. As you can see, I'm talking about basically just cordoning yourself off in like your Twitter ivory tower and just like, you know, being like the one slur, like looking out like, eh. <laughs> So, you know, and it can't just be about you as an individual alone, hunkering down and waiting for the storm of badness to pass. So there's Hank again. Um, so this, is uh, the same day as the Meme America tweet. And this is right after he was trying to reason with Chuck Woolery. <laughs> Which, that, yeah, it's like uh, best-selling author, <laughs> YouTuber, and science educator Hank Green tried to reason with former game show host Chuck Woolery on my behalf. <laughs> what a time to be alive. <laughs> so um, this was something that I didn't even really think about until months later. He did this um, with the intention of basically flushing out my mentions um, and, you know, putting positivity in there without drawing attention to what was actually happening. And it didn't really occur to me until months later what a brilliant tactic that is. But another thing that I realized, um, again, this has happened to me a lot over the years. Um, and every time, especially like as I used to work for this website that I, I won't name, but um, when I worked for this website and there would be like a flood of this sort of thing, the people who ran the website would either be to laugh about it, blame you for it, or ignore it altogether. And I, when Hank did this, I realized that this was the first time in all of these harassment campaigns that anyone in any position of power greater than mine had ever stood up for me. It was the first, and honestly, possibly the only to this date. Um, and I point this out because it really highlights how hard it is for people to stand up for their colleagues. But at the same time, again, like it was in a brilliant way because he was building support, but he wasn't drawing attention to the racists, but instead was urging people to build a platform of, of support. And it's, it's in a way sort of like a, a brilliant means of combating the primary weapon they have, which is to isolate you. So then uh, a few months later, 
Um, my friend Natalie Wynn was being, uh, well, she did this Vice interview, um, and uh, they posted it, and then, you know, the alt-right found it, and just, like, her mentions were just, like, flooded with transphobic dog shit. So, do the same thing again. This is a ContraPoints appreciation post. It is. <laughs> 1.6 thousand responses. Um, and so, like, that is a much more effective means of actually supporting people's mental health rather than drawing their harassment into the spotlight, which, of course, is only going to invite more. So, with this idea of you, the harassed one, as a disease, you're not, hopefully. Um, but I think the thing is, we have to start finding ways to support people who are going through this while not actually aggravating their trauma and inviting more harassment. So if you see someone going through something like this um, and you think it's the right thing to do, stand up for your friends and colleagues, because there are ways to do that without bringing attention to the harassment. They are trying to drown you out. So the best way to do that is to reply in kind. In my case, you know, what Hank did real, made me realize that I had a lot of support. And that was, this was the first time uh, that, any, that I had ever gone through one of these harassment campaigns that someone drew attention to support. And that, I think, is an incredibly valid tactic. And another thing is, people individual, on an individual level, they don't really know what to say whenever someone is going through something like this. It's like, they had, it's like an anxiety, like, oh, I don't want to you know, bother them. And it's like... Do it anyway. Like, find ways to support your friends and colleagues, because public support goes a long way. But at the same time, there is risk associated with it. You might invite harm by supporting someone that is being harassed, and I cannot say there is no risk. You might end up on someone's Pepe Silvia wall. Because <laughs> I, had, I had another colleague that is also going through a very bad harassment storm right now and has been for months who ended up on a totally non-ironic feminazi conspiracy wall just last week that looked just like this, but the guy was like, dead serious. Um, because, and again, they want you to live in fear of standing up for yourself and standing up for others. So, you know, there's a lot of energy right now about holding bad people to account. But I, want, I wonder also if there is a way we can harness some of that energy to protect people who are being abused by bad faith actors. Um, when Harry was doing his uh, um, presentation yesterday, he was talking about how it started out of spite, but ended up being really supportive, supportive in community building. And there are ways to engage with people who are being dogpiled by bad faith actors, uh, and that is a very charitable way to describe them, but also invite more harassment. So right now we're at a place where we need to figure out strategies to protect ourselves, but also strategies to elevate and bolster others that are not aggravating people's trauma, because it's so incredibly isolating. And it's only recently that I've started to see other people standing up for people being targeted. And another thing is, everyone responds to this sort of thing differently. Some people, if they were in my situation, would highlight it and stand up, you know, publicly stand up for themselves. But others like me hide away from it and hide away from the world and, you know, Onesler Tower and, you know, live in fear and then periodically delete your Twitter until you die. But the ultimate thing is, and I think this is true of everybody, is no one wants the worst thing that has ever happened to you to be the thing you become known for. But the reality is we are also living in a time when bad faith actors are, you know, feeling very empowered. So I hope that in the, you know, months and years to come, there is more focus on mental re health resources for people who make their livings online and for people who should happen to go through something like this. There should also be better strategy for being able to support people. Like again, like Carlos, his crime was standing up for himself and he's still being punished for it. And at the end of the day, it can't only be a thing that people think about when it happens to you. So my hope is that there is more research done, that there will be better resources for mental health prof professionals, because online abuse is becoming more and more common, and it's only going to become more and more common. And it's a huge blind spot for most therapists. That has been a huge challenge for me, getting therapists to understand, like, you know, 
the answer to, well, why don't you just log off? <sighs> so, but most of all, we need to build a culture of mutual protection and to be mindful of people's humanity, because that is ultimately the big problem, is they revoke your humanity and eventually you stop thinking of yourself as a human. And yeah, there is an inherent risk in standing up for your friends and colleagues who are being attacked by bad and often dangerous people. You know, we can't act like these people are not dangerous, they are. But <sighs> do it anyway, because the alternative is silence. Thank you. <laughs>